Um, so today we're going to talk about uh, joint retainers and um, how to deal with them when you're acting for spouses, um, when to maybe bow out, um, how to deal with those issues. So, and and they're they're tricky. Um, anytime we act for more than one person, um, you know, there's the potential for conflicts, and it's especially uh, ripe um, with with will planning uh, because uh, there are myriad of, of issues that could arise in the future. We're trying to predict the future in estate planning. And that's really the challenge of our, of our, uh, of our job. The first place to start, uh, obviously, is the rule of acting for joint um, in, a, in a joint retainer. And it's uh, governed by the rules of civil, uh, sorry, the rules of professional conduct. Um, and anytime we're acting for, let's just assume husband and wife, okay? Um, I, we've been asked to act for both of them, very common, where both spouses come in. Um, we have to advise them that, uh, that you've been asked that there's no confidentiality as between the three of them. So if, if, um, if one tells you something, you have an obligation to disclose that to the other. And then if there's a conflict that develops that can't be resolved, um, the lawyer can't act for either one of them. Um, and uh, may have to withdraw. So let's keep those in mind. Um, and then we'll talk about what happens after the retainer ends. So classically, the two spouses will come in and um, together and say, we want a will drawn for both of us. And most of the time, uh, that's not uh, a big concern uh, or doesn't, for example, rule us out. Um, so the key there, obviously, is that, that there be um, clear uh, uh, r r rules about the retainer, uh, i.e. the things that we've just, discovered, we've just discussed above, that there's no confidentiality. And the second um, part is looking for potential conflicts. So um, there are conflicts, as I said, anytime you act for more than one client in our business, um, one of the classic uh, conflicts is the idea that when one dies, um, if assets are given to the other one uh, with no strings, so an absolute gift, there are risks that that subsequent, that surviving spouse may change their will. In fact, it's a risk anytime, whether they change it before the first spouse dies or after. But the fact that that these uh, gifts, uh, these instructions are given on the assumption, and I think it's fair to say that most clients assume that when they give everything to their spouse and their spouse says they're going to give everything back to them, and that's what the two wills that you draft say, that one of them is not going to go out and change it before the other one dies without telling them. There's probably that, that general understanding, but that's, of course, not true. It's, it's not binding on them. Either can change their will with no strings. Uh, anytime they want without telling the other. The big idea, and, and usually, usually in a situation where it's a first marriage for both and they both share the same kids, we sort of acknowledge uh, when the typical instructions are given, uh, give it all to my spouse and then, uh, and vice versa. And then when both of us are gone, uh, give it to the kids equally. Let's take those very simple and typical instructions. There's the idea that, that well, you know, the survivor is going to take care of their own kids because they both, they're, they're their own kids. Uh, and, and we sort of acknowledge, yes, there's a conflict there because one spouse might say, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not comfortable with giving everything to my, my other, my surviving spouse because maybe they will remarry, right? I always joke that, you know, our, our profession is guided by two movies, uh, Disney films, The Lion King, which deals with, you know, brother against uh, brother, and Cinderella, where <clears throat> Cinderella's father made an absolute gift of the house when he died to the evil stepmother, which got her into this trouble and got Cinderella into this trouble. So there's always the risk, um, even in a first marriage without a blended family. That risk increases I would say tenfold um, in a situation where the two 
uh, spouses do not share all the same children. And that's really the key uh, to identify, in my view, as to when the conflict becomes you know, very, very important to identify and to somehow deal with. So there's no prohibition, first of all, to stop for, for not acting in both situations. And I would say most, most, you know, the vast majority of lawyers act in that situation. So the, the issue, of course, is that you have to go through those three um, points with, the, with, the, um, with the, both clients. But the risk of an absolute gift in that situation is so much greater because if spouse A, who's got kids A1 and A2, and spouse B, who's got kids B1 and B2, if A decides oh, I'll give everything to, or I'll give certain assets to B with no strings, absolutely. Because we've sort of, you know, we've got this joint plan and we're gonna divide, the survivor's gonna divide everything equally between all four kids. Um, and that's our plan. So I'm, A's gonna give everything to B and B's gonna give everything to A. And then if B and A are both dead, it's going to be divided equally among A1, A2, B1, B2, right? In that scenario, um, there's always the risk that, and, and, and I, what I would say to that client is you've got to assume that when A gives everything to B, B is going to change their will and it's only to B's case. And that's, you know, most estate fights, many, many estate fights are based on that very same uh, issue. And uh, the concept, uh, and we're going to talk about that next week, about mutual wills, this idea that this joint plan was more than just a, an idea or a wish. It was actually a binding agreement is, a, is what, what a mutual will uh, argument is. And we'll talk about that down the road. But the problem you can see, right? The problem you're acting for both those clients uh, in that scenario. And um, let's see if I've got a family tree here. Uh, I don't. Um, so you're acting for both those clients in that situation and <clears throat> you give the advice, oh, well, an absolute gift, you know, the survivor can change their will and everything else. And, and you give that instruction. They say, yeah, no, we understand. We understand. They still go ahead with it. That's great. Uh, you've, you've dealt with that. Now, of course, B does inherit everything and then changes her will to give everything to only her kids. And A1 and A2 say to you, well, you acted for both of them. Uh, your warning wasn't strong enough, or, you know, uh, they said they under, you know, they understood, but they were counting on the other one doing this. So your notes in that situation are so important. And I would say go farther than notes. I would, I would record that conversation because I want them to acknowledge it. And I would put it just as clear as that in saying everything you're giving to the other spouse, you must assume is not going to your kids um, because so often that happens. There's a falling out down the road with uh, A's kids and now B doesn't speak to A's kids anymore and they're not that nice and she decides to change her will. And, and there's always a reason for it, of course, but the, the problem is you acted for both. And the, the concern is going to be, did each of them, were each of them free to properly tell you their concerns? Or were they, because they were in the same room at the same time with each other influencing one another, that they couldn't, they, they couldn't tell you what they really wanted, which was, I want to protect my own kids. You know, uh, when it comes right down to it, I want to protect my own kids. And, and the, the argument for acting, for not acting in that situation is that you're in this conflict and you're there sitting, you have to act for both of them. And you're talking to one and they're saying, yeah, no, I'm, I'm good with an absolute gift. I trust you. I trust you. I trust you. And the other one is thing you can you can read their face, right? They're like, because uh, after you say to them, well, everything can go to the other kids and nothing to your kids, and they're like, well, um, well, don't you trust me? Don't you trust me? I'm going to treat us all. You trust me, okay? Can that client have you put them? I guess the question for you is, as the lawyer, have you put them in a position where you can a properly advise them independent of the other, with with their ability to be free and open with their, with their concerns and instructions. And I would argue that there are many situations where that is not uh, possible. And I'm sure if you've been in this business at all, uh, for any length of time, you've seen this exactly unfold, 
where they one of them calls you and says, yeah, we've agreed on a plan and you sit down, and you explain it to them. And they're like, oh, and once, yeah, I trust you. Oh, yeah, no, I'm never, I'm never going to get remarried. I'm never going to cut your kids out. I love your kids. Our kids get along. Um, if I had a dime for every time that was said and didn't work out, I, I, no, I wouldn't be that wealthy, but uh, I'd, have a, I'd have at least a buck um, extra. Because it, you know, it does happen. It, it happens all the time. And so what do we do to protect ourselves? Um, the first thing that we do um, is, uh, is obviously we get a, um, a, a retainer agreement. So I'm just going to cut this stuff out because that's all about fees and things like that, um, which we're happy to talk about. But this is the important part, um, which is really the acknowledgement that there's no confidentiality and the fact that we may have to, I might as a lawyer have to um, remove myself and not act if we can't resolve a dispute between the two of you. Um, and the whole concept of what happens after the retainer, which will talk about in a moment. So that's the first step. But my, my rule, because the problem, of course, is yes, we know there's a, there's a potential conflict, but people would say, well, let's, let's see how it goes. Let's try it out and see if there's a conflict. Well, by the time you find out that there's a conflict, uh, it might be halfway through the file, it might be more. And now you're in a situation where you've pretended to act or you did act for both both clients and then you've got a situation where you are in trouble because you're getting one set of you know one client wants to talk to you privately you can't do that and and you know this feeling that one of them's not that happy and with this idea of an absolute gift and one wants to do a trust but they're embarrassed to say it in front of their spouse and by the time you're down the road it, you're in a huge mess you're in a huge mess you realize you can, and you know in deep in sometimes not that deep, but, so, but often deep inside you, you know, you got a problem here. This is, there's a conflict here. And at that point, you're in trouble in the sense that you've got to say, okay, guys, you both have to go. Um, and, you know, you've created a bunch of not great situations. So um, I'm just going to throw out my rule, but I'm one of the only people who has this rule where I never act for two spouses where either of them has a, a child from a previous a relationship because I'm afraid of getting down the road too far and not being able to act. That's one thing. But more importantly, I don't think I can properly advise the client. Um, and I don't think the client can properly instruct me without being alone with me, without their spouse. So they can tell me all the feelings they have about how, how they feel about their stepkids and how I'm, they're more worried about their own kids and et cetera. And so in those situations, I don't have a problem with meeting with both of them to come up with a common sort of to talk, give them an outline of what they've talked about. But then I'm going to only act for one. And I say that right up front um, with my uh, before I get retained that I don't act in those situations. Again, that is a, an extreme position uh, relative to other people. But I um, but I feel strongly about it because of the because of the conflicts you can get in. And because down the road, when, when things hit, hit the fan and you're pulled in because you acted for both and they're pointing their fingers at you, um, I just don't, I don't really wanna be in that position. And I think it's better for the client. If the will is gonna be absolute to each other, it's better that each of them went to their own lawyer and that's what they talked to their lawyer and the lawyer can confirm I met alone with them. And that was what they really wanted to do. It wasn't under pressure. So. Uh, I point that out to you. Um, and uh, so, so that's what I want to talk about, at least at that stage. So again, if you're going to act for both, um, you know, it's very important that they understand that there are other options. So there's not just an absolute gift, but there are options of trusts. There are options of domestic contracts. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good idea in my view um, to, uh, <clears throat> to report that out as well. One of the things I put in a, in a reporting letter um, is that you've, uh, you were content to leave, and I do this in every case where I'm acting for both clients, you were content to, if, if they did decide to leave everything to each other, you're content to leave everything to each other. And you recognize that, um, uh, you know, that, that that could end up with your, your ultimate intentions being defeated because the 
surviving spouse might change their will and could per perfectly with no with no uh, restrictions. So um, so that's that. And then the the next part of it is just if you do act in a joint retainer, and then one of the other one of the parties comes to you subsequently and says, "Well, I want to change my will." When can you, what do you do in that situation? So the first thing, thank goodness, historically this was uh, an outlier. Nobody, law, the law society never commented on this. Now there is a full rule um, and commentary on this. And it says that, first of all, if they come back to you and tell you something after you've completed your initial retainer. So you acted for both, you drew their wills, they signed it, the retainer's over. Now they, one of them comes back to you and wants to tell you something. That is a new, a new retainer. That information is confidential. You cannot disclose that to the other party. By the same token, you can't act for that other, that single spouse, unless they, they're divorced, permanently ended their conjugal relationship, they, the other spouse has died, or the other spouse consents. Absent those, you cannot take on that single retainer after a joint retainer. Um, but you, but if they come to you and tell you information, you do not have to disclose that to the other side. You just keep it in confidence, but just then can't act. Okay. Um, so that's, uh, that's what I've, um, I wanted to point out there. So, um, that's that. Now we had some questions and, um, about the pro, uh, collaborative process. Yes. It's not uncommon to have. Uh, and again, I obviously use eState to do this, but um, I have you know both parties there. If they want, if they've got their independent counsel, uh, or I'm going to send them out later, I'd want them both there to plan it out graphically and say, here, take this plan now to your your lawyer, and you know let them let them go through it and and meet with you, and you know, and you may change your mind. You may say, I, you know, I, I didn't understand anything Jordy was telling me. And now I, you know, I get it. I don't want an absolute gift or I don't want to give my RSP to my surviving spouse, even though there's going to be tax because there's risks and, and things like that. So that's the, um, that's the, the idea there. Um, what is law pro's position? Can we discuss that issue? Uh, law pro, I don't believe has an, you know, they warn you whenever there's a joint retainer for sure. Um, uh, they certainly haven't, prohibited you acting in, for both spouses, even in blended families, uh, of course, as most of us uh, act for them, um, not me, but most, most lawyers do. Um, so they don't, but they would say to you, that is a red flag and a potential danger zone. Um, Cause we can all see that. Um, uh, so yes. Um, yes, James, the, the information does is, is solicitor client privileged in the second Retainer, it just can't be used and acted upon. Um, uh, yeah, so um, Teresa raises the issue of, you know, is it enough to just give them the warning and they agree to still proceed and you document in the reporting? Line? Of course, most, you know, most people, that's how most, most of us do things. Um, it's just, you want to go that, I, I would say, yeah, that's, that's great. M many lawyers don't even do that. I think it's important as well to confirm with them that this is not a mutual will agreement, uh, which means, uh, and again, we're gonna talk, talk about that uh, next week, but this, confirming that this absolute gift has no contract, no agreement, legally binding agreement associated with it, and the survivor can change their will. Um, because uh, obviously there are arguments to the contrary when there's no documentation. And next week we'll look at a case like that um, and, uh, uh, the errors that can occur um, in, in those situations. It's kind of part two of this joint retainer uh, agreement because it's that it's it's when things haven't been documented uh, that you can um, you can cause problems uh, for yourself and for your for everyone. Um, but yeah, I would be one to record that conversation and be very very clear about that possibility. Uh, exactly, it's the Ramage case. Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, and we're going to talk about that next, uh, next week. Um, so, um, yeah, so right now I'm, uh, we'll talk, Miriam, I got that question about, uh, about acting for intergenerational, um, and we'll get to that in a moment. So that's, 
that's what I wanted to discuss, at least raise with you um, about this area, which is so common and yet so fraught with peril uh, and increasingly so uh, as more and more families are blended and more and more um, uh, disputes occur and people get more litigious. Um, you can see why, uh, why uh, uh, kids would be disappointed if everything ends up, everything that their, their parent gave to their step parent ends up going only to the step parent's kids and nothing to them. Remember Cinderella whenever you get into these situations. Uh, that's what I always, that's the example I always give with my clients. Uh, you know, um, and, and, and it of course requires, we right now concentrated on absolute gifts, but of course then it requires, okay, you know, then they say, well, what are the options? Um, you know, and, and then we have spousal trusts and we have domestic contracts and mutual wills, but I don't want to talk too much about that. Um, because what they'll say, and, and if, if you've heard me talk before, you know how I describe a trust is if you, if you use the word but as a client to describe what you want, you want to trust. So clients will, they love the idea of a simple absolute gift to the surviving spouse. And then they say, they sneak, oh yeah, that's exactly what I want. Is there a way though that they, they can, uh, that if they remarry, you know, it ends up going to my kids? And I'm like, well, you just, you just covered over the word but there because you're saying you get it, but. Um, and so that's really where clients have, you have to drill down and make sure they're very comfortable with the idea of an absolute gift. Um, so first, Miriam, before we get to your uh, intergenerational question, I wanted to see if anybody uh, had some discussion points about um, joint retainer between um, spouses. Uh, Jordy, it's Fred. A couple, couple things. One, I think um, law pro's perspective is remember if there's a problem, you've got two deductibles. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, but is your is your is your policy then to you know discuss a, a potential plan with clients, send them out for in, independent advice, and then they come back and you draft, or are you saying, look, at, at that point, I'm I'm out of there. Um, the mm -hmm. only person drafting is is one of the two other lawyers. Yeah, no, I to be honest with you, the way I do it is, and it's right in my initial email that says, I do not act where there's a blended family. In that case, what I'll do is act for one of you and, and, um, and send the other one out to another lawyer. And I do that quite regularly. Um, you know, I don't have a problem with, uh, and, and maybe if, you know, in a perfect situation, you wouldn't even talk to the other one, you know, and you wouldn't, you know, but, but, um, I'm comfortable with having that initial meeting where I go through the different options and the plan and I can draft out my client's plan. And then at least everyone knows sort of the options out there. And, and I'm comfortable with that. Um, you could make the argument that that's too far. I shouldn't, I should just talk to them and then send each of them out. I choose not to do that though. Um, in, except in the most, uh, un, you know, occasionally I'll do that, but most people don't want me to just do work and not do any work. So. Um, and, and, you know, often we share that, you know, I'll, I'll do a draft and share it with the other lawyer and they can use it as a, you know, as their, their starting point and make whatever changes the, their client wants to make if they do. Thanks. Any other questions? Already in the situation just described where you draft it, you've met with both of them. Uh, you retain, uh, or the, let's say the husband's retained by you and the wife goes somewhere else and she has a will done. Yeah. Uh, you draft the, the will for the husband whereby you have given everything to the wife, absolutely. Right. But you don't know what the wife's done when she's gone to another lawyer. Correct. And, and so that's the, that there's a risk. They don't, but you don't know, the wife might have signed a, 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 a mirror will with, with, uh, with me too um, and then changed it. So there's, there's always, that's, that's the risk. If you're banking on the spouse doing something different, there, there's a problem. Then you've got to think about some other option. But I would, I think that possibility, maybe not equally, um, but that, I guess that comes, that only reinforces my point that, you know, if that's what they're going to do, then that's what they're going to do. And, and you run a risk of making an absolute gift unless we do something else. It's fraught. It's, it's again, fraught with, with peril because the, you know, it, it proves the point, but it also raises a whole other issue, right? You know, now often they'll exchange copies of the will um, once it's signed, but you know, uh, sure. That's the, that's the whole point is that they go to their own lawyer and maybe decide something differently. So 
it's a Fred, it's a problem. Great. It's Fred again, Jordy. You've identified the risk of them changing their their will, but there's also the risk that they may be agreeing to something that they're that that's less than what they're entitled to under family law. Well, they're not agreeing to anything in the sense that that I mean, they always have the Family Law Act election. If that's something different, uh, if if the instructions are going to give rise to that, um, you know, and the estate warns you about that, right? So if you do a plan um, with estate um, and and you're not giving enough um, to the to the surviving spouse, then estate's actually going to warn you about that. Um, so, but yeah, that's always. That's always, then you can at least warn the client, look, this whole plan may fall apart without a domestic contract. Yeah. Um, so, uh, the, we're getting lots of questions here. Uh, not surprising as this is an important topic. So, um, do you discuss the FLA election with spouses? Yes, I would, if they're not leaving everything to each other. Um, so, uh, E-State has that warning. Um, so uh, let me just see if I can pull it up. But uh, um, uh, let's just see that. But yeah, so E-State would recognize that I'm not giving everything. And so, yeah, then, then I would definitely uh, raise that with, with, um, uh, with the client and say, hold on a second. Um, you've, you've used the spousal trust. There's a p potential FLA election here. And uh, I don't know if we've done that before, but. Um, we can try that here. Uh, so yeah, I would discuss that if it was an issue. I mean, it's te technically it's always an issue, but of course, if, the, if everything's absolute, it's you know the chance of an election is very slim. Um, so you know, here we're doing a trust for you know. Um, let's just do a quick uh, QST um, here, and um, you know, the, at that point. Um, there's the potential of a, a family law act election, right? So it warns you about that. Consider warning them. So, um, Teresa, I find that many couples, even blended families, have most assets joint. What do you suggest in that situation? So, of course, that is a key element. So, if I, you know, if if um, if E State would saw that, for example, um, it would say to me, um, here you've made something joint. Um, but you've got a different resolution in the will. Um, and so you better document that, um, use a confirmation. Um, so that's how I would deal with that joint. If the true intention is that it be joint. Um, and that's a, look, that's a, that is a mini will for those assets. And, and whenever I see joint assets, um, you know, that's one of the reasons we get asked all the time here. I'm just going to try to show you this. We get all asked all the time. You know, why are joint assets not automatically put into the joint designated asset section? Um, so I originally didn't do that for the reason that, first of all, I didn't trust if the client was right about things being joint. And plus, I might want to show, um, we might want to do a different plan where we're not giving things joint. But we, ha we are coming up with a solution where you'll be able to check that so it'll automatically go in um, for any beneficiary designations or joint assets. But yeah, I, I would say to them, you know, you've done a spousal trust or you've done a trust for the home or whatever else. And, but it's going to pass automatically to the survivor. And they might say, well, that's okay. Um, because, you know, we're holding it, we're, we're, we're holding it as 50, 50 tenants in common, but legal title is as joint tenants. I've seen that many times before. So, um, but yeah, that's a huge risk when things, when their plan doesn't match their ownership and, if there's one area for that's ripe for errors, that's the one where clients have a will that deals with it one way, but the actual ownership of underlying assets uh, is is different, and they don't own it, or they or a trust owns it, or they own it jointly with right of survivorship, and the plan doesn't match with the ownership. Uh, and so, yeah, that's a huge issue with blended families because when they try to use a butt, a butt doesn't work on joint assets. That's the that's the way I would put it. You know, you said, but, but it doesn't work. You're going to have to change the ownership. So how are we going to do that? We're going to change, actually change the ownership of the home. So instead of owning the home, for example, joint, we're going to own that 50, 50. And we're going to change the ownership from joint to partial. And then we're going to, you know, put in the uh, other spouse and, uh, and I uh, forget Laurel, I guess is the other spouse. 
and save that. I hope that doesn't uh, screw things up. But that's how. But that can't be done in the will, right? Some people ask us that as well. Like, well, I'll just do it in the will if I do it. That a will doesn't do that. You have to actually change the ownership in some other way while you're alive. Uh, transfer of real property into joint tenancy or into tenants in common, or change the ownership of certain accounts, etc. So, other questions. Obviously, this is a huge area for lots of issues. Um, good. Okay. So, um, anything else people want to discuss about joint acting for joint uh, and joint retainer for spouses? Okay. Um, so the other thing was, um, I guess, Miriam, you raised the issue about a. Um, uh, you know, a, a parent and a child, I would deal with that personally as a two, two separate retainers. Um, even if they want to come, uh, I don't see that as a joint retainer uh, exactly. I mean, it could be a joint retainer, I guess, but I would rather treat that as two separate retainers. And that's how I deal with this kind of thing. I say, look, I'll act for you, mom, and I'll act for you, uh, son, but I'm going to act for you separately. Uh, we can have a common planning meeting initially, but I'm going to just confirm instructions separately and not treat it as a joint retainer and tell you, because the kid might say, you know, what, I, you know, I, I, I want to leave it. And if my mom's not alive, I want to leave it to my girlfriend that my mom doesn't know about, or I want to leave it to this charity. Well, the mom might not want to leave it to that charity. And um, now you're, you know, you got a bit of an issue. So that's how I would deal with that. Um, so other questions? Great, we're just after one. Um, so I do want to try to keep it to about half an hour. Um, Jordy, what you've done yeah. is scared the hell out of all of us. Well, <laughs> it's, it's one that's worth being scared about. Not, if you're not taking, I think it's, it's, it's the most common area that that's, gives rise to concerns. And, and all I'm saying, I guess, is that you, you got to spend more time. This is not one where you just say, oh, okay, everything to each other, no problem. Because if you, as we talk about next week, um, the Ramage case was exactly that. And the comment the judge said is that the, the lawyer didn't even ask, didn't even raise this as an issue. And what was he, you know, like didn't pay any attention to this. And, um, you know, that's what I'm, I guess I'm trying to make clear is that I, I think this is an area that's so common and, so it gives gives rise to such potential liability that it's one that you got to spend a little more time on um, if you're going to deal with that. Not to stop dealing with it, just deal with it. Just make sure you're you're careful. I guess. Raise all the issues and document it, and and have a good retainer. Right, Jordy. Yeah, uh, I've got a question. So um, you're mentioning that. So like in a will, you can't change the beneficial ownership, not beneficial ownership, uh, the designated beneficiary or uh, joint uh, tenancy owners, but you can change the insurance beneficiaries. Is that yeah, correct? I'm talking about ownership. So, so yeah, you can't change ownership in a will. You could designate beneficiaries through the will, um, anything governed by the Succession Law Reform Act and the insurance or the Insurance Act. But what I'm saying is you can't sever a joint tenancy. You can't change a joint bank account into uh, two separate bank accounts. That's that's what you have to you have to do outside the law. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks everybody. Um, I hope this was of some help and not too scary, um, but it is something <laughs> that we have to be you know be aware of. And uh, so next week we're going to talk about the options that you have in acting for. Um, for blended families and, and spouses in this situation. Um, and so, uh, yeah. So, so. Jordy, when, when we're putting this in, uh, this counts for our, our hours with the law society. This is a half an hour of professionalism. This, Today's this. session is one half hour of professionalism. Okay. And if you have questions about that, it's best to address them to Michaela. Um, and the provider is East State Academy. 
So okay. if you're looking so that for that was yeah, E State Academy. And and it should be yeah, we'll make sure that that's communicated uh, to to you to everyone. I think in the past I've just put you as a provider. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't. I think it has to be yeah, it's E State Academy. So okay, All right. if, thank, thank yeah. you. Okay, great. Can I ask a question about something totally different? Sure. Um, Maybe I'll just say to anybody, of course, that's the end of the formal program, but please feel free to stick around. <laughs> Sorry. No um, in terms of doing remote executions, I'm drowning in paper. Oh. I, do I have to print the entire will? That I have to print the entire thing? I, I, I believe you do. Because it talks about executing a complete, um, I don't have the uh what would it be the order and council uh remote execution of wills let's see what we find here um i'm not sure there may be a link here to uh oh that's from saskatchewan that won't help us but it, it talks about a full um, oh, here it is issued. The attached order was issued. Uh, let's see if they got the right one. Um, uh, nope, that's not the right one. Okay, I'll find the right one. But basically, it talks about a complete co a copy. Um, and so how do you prove that it's a complete copy unless you're, 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 you're Hello. you've got that attached? Hello? Yes. Okay, so every every page of every document is shown yeah. by every party. My goodness, that's a lot of paper. It's ter it's a terrible process. Um, it's a terrible process, and um, but uh, it is uh, an option. I'm I've basically said to clients, um, you know, we have this option for audio visual, and I would use it in the case where literally there's n none of the other options are are working. Uh, i.e. coming to my, you know, home, uh, you finding your own witnesses. Um, if neither of those options work and we need to do it remotely, well, just understand we're going to, you know, we're, you're going to print out your copy. We're going to print out our copy. You're going to sign. I'm going to sign. You're going to watch me. I'm going to watch you. Then we're going to, then you're going to carry your original back to me. Then I'm going to put them together. Then I'm going to do affidavits of execution from both, from the witnesses. Then I'm going to carry them back. You know, I mean, yeah, it's a, Sorry. Okay, that, that's all right. That's what I've been doing, but I was sort of hoping against hope maybe I could just do the the final signing pages and attach those. But no. Yeah, but. I mean, there's been people who have said that, but uh, oh, here we go. Figures. Um, you know, there are people who have said that. I, I personally don't agree, um, and uh, because I, I think the the um, uh, the order in council, if you read the order in council, I think it talks about a complete copy, identic a complete identical copy. Uh, I don't think you're doing that if, you know, now is somebody going to, you know, is anybody going to complain? I don't know. <laughs> you know, if you only hand in the signature pages, is the court going to reject that? We don't know. Yeah. So that's, that's my only, that's my point there. Okay. On that point, Jordy, have they, have they given a, an end date to when, you know, when these um, remote wills are going to be, are accepted until, like, I, I know there was an extension, but I don't know how long. Yeah, it keeps getting extended. I, I think it's going to be around for a while. That would be my yeah. sense. Um, it's going to be around for a while. It may even be permanent in some way. Um, yeah, I agree. It's, it's, it's really <laughs> burdensome. Yeah, here's the blog exactly. post that we did. Uh, here's the order. Uh, finally found it. Sorry about that. Um, but um, the signatures required may be uh, by signing or subscribing complete identical copies in counterpart. So mm -hmm. if, if you take the position that you've executed a complete identical, identical copy, but you're not including it, okay. I mean... I, I'm just, I, I'd rather, I'm not going to take that risk personally, but. Okay. But if I, and if I, if I have my um, other witness with me, then yeah. we have two copies, right? So Correct. they're. Yeah. They're one for the testator. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I typically do it. 
Okay. All right. Well, sure. thank you for your advice. Yes. Sure. So thanks everybody. Um, and uh, we'll see you again next week for more, for more on this topic and, and really getting into some of the, uh, the options and how to describe those to the clients. So thanks again.